Hello Jim, it's been uh, three years since uh, we met uh, when uh, Thunderbolt was released in France. At that time we didn't know that how it would be received. Yeah. It was just the beginning on uh, September 12th, uh, three years ago. Yeah. And uh, of course in 10 days it was uh, a huge success in yeah. France and it was a huge success uh, all around the world. I'm very glad to meet you, of course, yeah. and meet to meet you again after all we've been through. Yeah. It's very important that we meet face to face. And yeah. we can I agree, isn't it crazy? Touch. It's yeah. crazy, yeah. And uh, we didn't uh, do the Zoom thing because yeah. we wanted to save for this okay, good. moment. Good, good. So it's, uh, I'm very glad to be good, here good. with you. Uh, I wanted to know how you went from Thunder Road to the Wolf of Snow Hollow. Yeah, so... I had written The Wolf of Snow Hollow a year before I had written the feature of Thunder Road. So when we had won Deauville and South by Southwest and had gotten into Cannes and Thunder Road became this cultural phenomenon that it is, um, we were speaking about making this movie, this werewolf movie, and knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, would you let us do this film? And uh, and in doing so, MGM and Orion Pictures said, yeah, we want that film. And so it happened very quickly where we got greenlit to make the film, but the script wasn't very good at that time because I had written it a year before I was a successful filmmaker. And I went, oh, fuck, and now I have to make this script good. And so I spent like the next six months just changing it and making it as good as I could. And then we shot it with the same team as Thunder Road in Utah, um, in America, with Robert Forrester. And it was a much bigger movie. It was a $2 million movie, which was a dream come true that I got to pretend to be David Fincher for you know, a month uh, in making this film. But it was also very difficult to make the film any good because there were so many different people around making the film. I had to answer to so many different people. It was very unlike making Thunder Road, where I had complete creative control. You were working with studio executives? Yeah, studio executives. And then also my producers, and then everyone else on set. How was it to work with Robert Foster as an actor? It was great. It was great. It was, um, it was surprising. I didn't, I didn't think he would say yes to it. But my producer, Matt Miller, had worked on a film with him called Too Late. And he said, I think Robert would be good for this. And so he sent him the script. And Robert called his manager and said, yeah, I want to do this movie. And the manager said, but it's a werewolf movie. And he goes, yeah, I don't really care about the monster stuff. It's the stuff in between that I really like. And, um, you know, his character is, a, is my father who's dying of a heart condition. He's a, a heart problem. And uh, he eventually dies in the film. And he, in real life, Robert was dying of cancer and didn't tell anybody. So it was this, like kind of strange meta example of making a movie with someone and they're playing someone who's dying and then they actually were dying and all of the comedy of not being able to tell people and I think that's what he meant when he said that's the stuff that I like, the stuff in between. Um, but he was such a nice guy and he was just everybody's kind of grandfather, this kind of like mascot for the film production and he was so nice and just really, really un unbelievable. He's a very popular uh, figure. Yeah, yeah. In the movie industry. Yeah, for the last 50 years, he's been making movies. It's great. This is scary. It's new. I never saw a body like that. It's a murder. It's nothing new. Treat it like a murder. You get the team together, all right? You get all the guys together, you handle them, I'll handle everything else. Oh, my God. Yeah, the fact that it was not released uh, widely, uh, yeah. how did that happen? We were planning on it being a much wider release, but then the pandemic happened, and so it was supposed to come out in March of 2020, and then it got pushed to October of 2020. And in some cases, that was really great because it was around Halloween in America, so so many people were watching horror films. Um, and because Candyman and Halloween Kills didn't come out, uh, our movies rose to the top. So it was like independent films like ours, and um, Scare Me and a bunch of American independent films became very popular, but I had no control over it. Like, w we called MGM a couple of times and said, the movie should be coming out in France. You could be making money, basically. Like, talking to the studio heads and be like, you, like, you guys like money, right? That's what you're supposed to be caring about. Like, France is such an incredible cinephile community, and they loved my last movie. It should be coming out in theaters. But they were busy. They were doing James Bond. They were doing all kinds of stuff, and... I, I had no control over how the film came out. I 
I'm John. I'm an alcoholic. I've been in the program now for six years. Sober for three. I've got a trivia question. Okay, cool. That's an uh, on ongoing uh, debate on the internet. Uh, what's the most powerful, uh, what's the most dangerous, vampires or werewolves? <laughs> what's your take on this? Because we need you well. to wait on it. <laughs> And why did you choose a werewolf? I thought it was going to be a serious question. That's really good. Uh, I think, well, vampires live forever and, uh, and werewolves, you know, th their lives are so out of control they could easily get harmed. I think, I think vampires would probably win in a fight between the two of them. Let me just make this perfectly clear. There is no such thing as werewolves. After the experience you had with uh, the Wolf of Snow Hollow, how did you come up with the idea for the beta test? I was uh, in a grocery store And I had the idea for the envelope service. And I called PJ and said, what would you do if this happened, if, if it landed in your mailbox? You got this letter. And he was like, oh, I wouldn't do it, obviously. Um, but he was like, would you do it? And I was like, no, of course I wouldn't. But then we, it just became this interesting idea, like a Twilight Zone episode or a Black Mirror episode or something like that. And we just talked about it for the next seven months. And then we realized that it was about lying and cheating And we just wanted to make something about that too, that like people have this facade where they're pretending to be someone that they're not in business in, in Hollywood. Um, and it just kind of worked together. And then the data idea came in of like how you would actually do the letter service and scrape people's data. Um, and so really it was about a year of just workshopping it until it felt like, yeah, this is a movie. And then we wrote it in you know three months or something like that it was a very quick process yeah but how do you find the people who would answer to that this kind of letter yeah. and does it have anything to do with the uh, i love you uh, mail oh yeah yeah, yeah. like <laughs> spam something mail. like that yeah i mean it feels like that like we wanted it to be kind of like spam mail where it's like uh you know hook up with this russian beautiful woman and it's just people will go down and then they take get all their money taken away from them we wanted it to seem like that but it would be very different if it was an envelope and it landed and it was directly to you or it would feel different um, and I just thought it was funny it's a crazy idea because it's but, by name yeah it's by name and it seems like a wedding invitation it seems like a proper thing I don't know I, that would make me very uh, upset I would be like I don't know what this is what the fuck is this thing in my life um, So yeah, I, I don't know. It was just an interesting idea. Um, and then we just kind of went away with it. We thought it would be neat to find people who would be perfect for each other because of their public profiles and connecting people through the internet. Now I'm suspicious of everyone. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe it's my wife. People are so terrified of stepping out of line. The consequences won't go away anymore. On this movie, you share directing duties and you co-star with yeah. PJ McCabe. Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, um, it works very well. So PJ is actually my best friend in real life, and we have the same sense of humor, and we have the same sense of like what's going to be cool in a movie. And so we'll write the film out loud, kind of like this, where we'll have... We'll stand in a room and we'll have two different laptops and we have like an outline and we go through the outline and then we act the whole thing out of like, oh, let's do the scene. Oh, that's really good. And then we'll write it down. And so throughout the process of the writing, it really does feel like directing a little bit. So like we ended up just kind of co-directing because we had already directed the movie in the writing process. And then we just had to enact and make visual what the screenplay was. So it works really well where I'll be on set And I'm acting in a scene, and he's on monitor, like watching me on frame. And then I'll fuck something up, and he goes, "Nope, go back, do it again." And so we're constantly criticizing each other and trying to make the performances better. Really, my favorite part of directing with PJ was when we didn't have to act in the scenes, where it was like one of the murders, and we both got to hang out behind the camera and and make it good. The opening scene, I feel like, is one of the craziest scenes in the movie. It's so violent, um, but we really did get to, to pretend to be David Fincher on that night of like doing all the fun Zodiac style cinematography and things. How did you cast uh, Virginia yeah. Newcomb uh, and Jesse Barr? Yeah, in the wives in the film. Virginia Newcomb was in a film called The Death of Dick Long, um, and I know the director of that because we went to university together, we went to Emerson College, and 
she's amazing. She's such a talented actress. She's from Alabama. And I always wanted to work with her. In fact, I wanted her to play Ricky Lindholm's character in The Wolf of Snow Hollow, and the studio said she's not big enough. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, I was like, all right, well, I always want to work with this, this person. And then because I had written the beta test, I was like, oh, this could be the opportunity. Virginia could play Caroline in the film. And, uh, and immediately I knew that she was going to be perfect for it and was like, cool, you got the part. And then Jesse is a filmmaker. Jesse Barr made Sophie Jones that was at Deauville last year, uh, and she's also an actress. And when I was writing the script for Lauren, for PJ's wife, I was thinking about like, who could this be? And I was like, oh, I think I've been writing this for Jesse Barr, kind of by accident. And then she came into audition, and she's a perfect actress. She like could she she knew everybody's lines better than we did, and she was able to do the monologue perfectly without changing it every time we shot her. She was amazing. Um, I was very lucky. Like it's crazy. Like to be able to find people who are perfect and so interesting to watch. Um, I felt very, very lucky. You have two composers credited yeah. on the music. Yeah. How did you work with them? That's uh, Jeffrey Campbell Biner yeah. and Ben Lovett. Yeah, so... Two very different profiles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one young and one... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, M yeah more seasons. Um, so Jeff Binner uh, came on very early on when we were writing the screenplay and we wanted it to be a very like Italian giallo 1970s horror movie like Dario Argento music with harpsichord and all kinds of stuff and so Jeff was doing all of that stuff very early on and then when we were editing the film we started incorporating all of this classical music all of this Vivaldi that was making the movie work better and then there were certain things like the opening titles where I was like oh I think we should get I think we should get Ben Lovett to do some of this stuff Ben had done the score for The Wolf of Snow Hollow, and it's so big and so impressive. And I was really in a jam where I was like getting close to the deadline, and we need these big opening songs and stuff. And Ben said, yeah, I can do that. And so uh, we sent him his scenes, and he loved the movie. It was like, oh, my God, yes. And so he does the kind of like girl humming in the opening of, uh, of like, la, 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 la. It feels like Rosemary's Baby. And, uh, and then that becomes the bigger music throughout. Um, he, yeah, he did a fucking phenomenal job. So really, it's like Jeff Binner, uh, Ben Lovett, and Vivaldi. And that, that, those are the and composers. That fits the perfectly. <laughs> they really are that good. They really are as good as Vivaldi, yeah. Uh, was it about editing? Did you have trouble editing with all that music? Uh, yeah, so because we knew that we wanted it to be, to, to be what it is, of like this kind of fun, constantly interesting musical film, like a giallo From film. the get-go. From the get-go. From the opening credits. Uh, from the opening credits, yeah. We knew that we wanted it to be that big and exciting. Um, it but, sets the bar yeah, very high. Yeah, oh, it's so crazy. It's yeah. so big and so spooky, so it had to live up to that. Um, but yeah, in the edit, it, it took 16 months. I was editing it kind of by myself in my garage, so it was, it was hell. I'm constantly trying different things and trying to see if it'll work. Um, so yeah, I mean, li so much of the movie was found. The language of the movie was found in the edit. I'm fine. Everything's great with me. This isn't a midlife crisis. I'll let you know when I'm having one of those. <laughs> hey, Jacqueline, perfect timing. Can you provide a full uh, time frame from uh, beginning, beginning to the to end? end? Yeah. yeah, so that people understand how long uh, it takes. How long yeah. it takes. So I called PJ with the initial idea, and it would have been in... Uh, like late 2018, so probably December of 2018 with the initial idea. And then I went off to do The Wolf of Snow Hollow, and when that was in March of 2019, and we shot the WeFunder video, we were talking about it for the previous four months, and then we shot the video to, to make the film on set uh, for The Wolf of Snow Hollow, and then we were writing the script, and when we raised the money, the script wasn't done. It was like kind of halfway done. Okay. But then we got to finish it together in a rush to then make the beta test. And I'm so glad we did it that way. So probably the idea was like December of 2018 was the initial idea. Then we started writing the film really in like April of 2019. And then we were shooting it by October of 2019. The film wrapped in November of 2019. And then I finished the film by February of 2021. Oh, so it was very quick. Yeah, very quick. But the entire year of 2020, I was editing the film. 
What's going on here? Hold on. Wait, this is really happening? You really did this? In this climate? Since you make the movie from the writing to the editing with the expectations uh, rising, uh, how do you manage all these duties yeah. which can be uh, opposite at some point? Yeah. Uh, is the editor fighting with the writers? Uh, yes, he is. You? Yes, he is. Are you yeah, becoming yeah. crazy? Uh, yeah. And since you were two on this... Yeah. PJ was with me in the edit the whole time. So like I would send him this cut and then he would watch it and then have a bunch of notes. So really we were you know, together in making this, this edit, and it was great. Um, although I was doing all of the clicking and stuff, he was very helpful in advising on how to make each moment work, which was very valuable, um, that I didn't have, really, on Thunder Road. Um, but yeah, I, it, it is difficult to make movies this way. And you had people uh, on Thunder Road. Producers, we could have a screening. We could have like people come in and watch the film and then give notes and then I could go away and edit the film. But with, with COVID, we couldn't do that. So it was literally just me and PJ doing this. And he would get tested and then come and stay with me for a week. And then we would just edit the film for a full week and then he'd go away. Um, but yeah, no, it, it is hell. It's hell making movies like this. It's torture to make movies like this, where you spend three years, two years working on a project, constantly doing all of that, of every particular thing in a, in a film. All of the sound design, all of the tweaks are, are done through my hands, these two hands exclusively. And if I'm in a bad mood, or if I'm hungover, the, nothing happens with the movie that day. So it's, it's really brutal to make movies like this. I, you know, I think this might be the last movie that I make this way. Yeah. I think, I, I think really, for my own health, I think it's not worth it. Um, so it's fun to be Jackie Chan. It's fun to do everything, um, but it's exhausting. Yeah. So you wouldn't recommend it to... I recommend it to everybody. I, I, think, I think everybody should do it. I think everybody should make movies. You can do it right now. We're shooting on two different cameras, and it's incredible footage with great lenses that are accessible to people, and you can tell your story. It's never been easier to make a movie, and you'll learn and feel so much more confident in yourself by doing it on your own. That's the thing. Uh, at the same time, in the same breath, you're saying it's hell, but it's never been easier. So what is it? Look at me. I mean, I'm in France being interviewed with a team about a goofy joke that I made with my friend PJ, and I'm on the world stage playing at Deauville, and it's like everybody should, this is the dream, right? This is like, when everybody's making movies, they want to have their friends be famous. And it feels weird that I've reached that, and I'm almost, I'm dead inside. <laughs> um, it's very, it's very painful to make movies this way. It's exhausting. But it's exhausting. But I get to be Jackie Chan. I get to like be this writer, director, actor, and I get the shit kicked out of me in the film. And, um, but you still got your teeth. Yeah, I still have my teeth. That's true, that's true. Yeah, I, have, I didn't break a bone on this film. I broke a bone on Thunder Road. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't break anything on this film. So it's hell, but it's worth it. Yes. Definitely. And I'm saying that now, that it's hell, if you ask me in three weeks after all of this, I go, yeah, I'd do it again. Let's do it again. Yeah, you need a vacation. It's like gambling addiction. It's like, it, you know, it's like you're, you're addicted to this thing. It's terrible. It's like, because it, it, when you're not making movies, it's very lonely. You're, you can become very lonely when you don't have the crew and you're making things on your own. Um, and then as soon as you say, let's do it, it feels like going to summer camp. You get to see your friends again. It's, um, it's very addictive. Uh, knowing that you are in total control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the important thing of making small films is that you have complete control over them. Like, every decision that went into the beta test was me and PJ's, and that was it. I think maybe now is a good time we all take a break and, and reassess what it is we're doing here. Can you tell us about the, the tour that you are making right now? You've been in Paris uh, yeah. with uh, the beta test. Yeah. You've shown uh, it at the Champs-Élysées Film Festival. Yeah. Uh, now we are in Strasbourg for the European Fantastic Film Festival. Yeah. Uh, the, right here. Uh, last night you were showing uh, the beta test, test and you had a Q&A. Yeah. Uh, how was it received so far? Really well, actually, surprisingly. Um, it's a very funny movie. It's great to watch a movie with a French audience and they all laugh. I feel like with French audiences, going to the cinema is much more like going to a museum where everybody's very quiet and all yeah. that. Um, and so we're getting good laughs and that's funny to me. Uh, it's a good thing. 
Um, and then people come up afterwards and they're like, that was really great, fuck Hollywood. Uh, and that's, that's a really funny thing to hear. Um, but no, it's been good. I came here because New Story, our French distributors, um, have been submitting it to places like this and Deauville and it's amazing to watch it with a French crowd that are expecting Thunder Road, this like touching, very sad movie, and instead it's this like insane parasite style film. Well, Thunder Road was touching and touching funny. And funny, yeah, yeah. Constantly. But now it's like touching, funny, dramatic, detective, horror, ridiculous, sexual. It's like a very, it's so many genres in one. It's, it's, it's very strange. Yeah, it's a very strange movie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A couple of weeks ago, I got a letter in the mail inviting me to a no-strings-attached sexual encounter in a hotel room. It's pretty card, looked official, I don't know, I was stupid. I went, what? Dude, this is nuts. How would you present that movie? In France, it's, it's difficult because I think you have to introduce it as a comedy. And so it's, it's interesting where... Um, just, just like the design of the poster should be a bit funnier, um, and so the trailer has to be a bit funnier as well. Um, whereas in America, we're just going to be doing like Fifty Shades of Grey. It'll yeah. seem like okay. it'll seem much more like a, a horror film that's sexy because there's a huge audience for that in America. Whereas like the French watch the film as like a straight comedy of like Hollywood is stupid and we are more powerful as the public than Hollywood is, and. Uh, that's my favorite way to see the film. How does it work for you that uh, you've been uh, saying at Q&As that are being filmed, fuck Hollywood? There's a line in the film where PJ goes, what, are we going to get into trouble? And it's like, that's kind of how I feel, of like, what's the worst that can happen? You say, fuck Hollywood. Everybody hates Hollywood, you know? Like, they're laughing. Everybody hates Hollywood. It's like, and I think everybody understands what Hollywood is, sometimes better than people in Hollywood. Like, everything that you know about Hollywood or that you think about Hollywood is true. There are corrupt people. It's terrible for women to work in. Um, they don't make great stories. It takes forever. There's a lot of bullshit. And because of the power dynamics, the uh, dynamique de puissance in Hollywood, um, people are terrified of speaking honestly about it. And I just wanted to make a joke. I just wanted to make a movie that was funny about it. Okay, so uh, you're still going to work in Hollywood? On that front? I've never worked in Hollywood. I mean, like, we've, I live in Hollywood, but really, we made this movie because people on the internet, strangers on the internet, gave us money to make this movie. Like, even if I get canceled, even if I get blacklisted, I can still go back to doing this thing, to making movies with my friends in my backyard. Like, if that's the worst case scenario, that's still a great career. I still get to have fun. And there might still be people in Hollywood calling you anyway. Yeah, I mean, like, nobody in Hollywood so saw... Halloween Kills. Yeah, I'm in Halloween Kills, yeah. yeah. So David Gordon Green, who also I see as kind of outside Hollywood, I see him as an independent yeah. filmmaker um, who dabbles in Hollywood. Yeah, he called me and I get to be in, I get to be in Halloween Kills. <laughs> you are very active on uh, the internet. You have uh, Twitter spaces. Yeah, You've sure. You've been experimenting. You're constantly yeah. online, yeah. helping people, trying to who try to make it uh, to make movies. Yeah. And you're giving advice. You're uh, telling stories. You're an open yeah. book. Yeah. How is it going? And uh, do you plan to keep going forward? I think so. Yeah, because I've been able to make movies independently in America. People email me, or they'll you know message me on Instagram or Twitter and say, "Hey, I have this problem. How do I fix this problem?" And I'll answer it for them on Twitter privately, and then nobody else hears that answer. And so I end up having to answer the same questions over and over again. Whereas by having it be public in Twitter spaces, someone asks a question, and I tell the answer, and then 400 people yeah, hear it live on yeah, spaces. on spaces. And so it's amazing to be able to have that kind of help for people. I didn't have that growing up. There was no real outlet to be able to help people in independent films. So I struggled for a long time. But now I feel very good that I can help people all at once. And it takes me one hour, once a week, and I get to give back in a fun way. Um, and I want to see better movies, you know? Like, if this helps to encourage the next generation of filmmakers to make better movies, so it's very selfish. Yeah, I, I get to watch better films. Are you going to get uh, something back from that? 
I don't think so. <laughs> no, I mean, really, just hopefully better films that people will go off and make movies on their own. Maybe uh, people crediting you uh, thanks to <laughs> Jim Carrey. Well, actually, it's funny you say that. I've heard people give speeches when they're accepting an award, and they'll say like, "I want to thank Jim Cummings for like inspire like yeah. like." So it does feel like <laughs> helpful. It does feel it does feel like there is like an actual yeah. benefit to it. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you to the Festival European Film Fantastique de Strasbourg for having, uh, having us, having you uh, today. You are showing um, The Wolf of Snow Hollow today, and yeah. you're going to be presenting and having a Q&A. It's the it. first time I'll be watching the film in a cinema. Because of COVID, I, I haven't been able to watch it in the cinema, so it'll be great. Oh, that's a great. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. You. Thank you so much, man. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Karaoke. Yeah, yeah. Doing Amy Winehouse. My voice is fucking <laughs> awful. Wait.